This video is brought to you by Squarespace. In 2006, researchers first detected a strange peak in the amount of methane in Earth's atmosphere, a greenhouse gas more powerful than carbon dioxide. While the scientific community rushed to explain the sudden rise, they found, to their surprise, that for once at least, it didn't match any relative increase in human fossil fuel use. It looked as if overnight a big new source of methane had simply turned on. Something happening on a global scale, but no one could determine what was actually causing it. These methane spikes happen every 100,000 years or so and are usually an indication of an ice age termination event, a rapid warming at the end of an ice age that within just a couple of decades transitions the planet from largely ice covered to the climate that we experience today. But the last one only happened 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last glacial maximum. So why are we seeing another rise in methane so soon and what is causing it? And 16 years later, as the peak continues to grow year on year, are we on track for a major climate reversal? This is a topic that I find absolutely fascinating. It's rare we find such a predominant smoking gun of something happening on a global scale that we fundamentally don't understand, that also isn't the result of our direct impact on the planet. To answer the question of what is actually going on here, we need to understand some of the history of the planet and its climate. Currently, we're in the Quaternary Period, spanning from about 2.58 million years ago to the present day. The Quaternary Period is broken into two different epochs. The first is the Pleistocene Epoch, from about 2.5 million years ago to 11,700 years ago, and it was known for its cyclical ice ages, where during glaciation periods, vast ice sheets would expand to cover much of North America, Northern Europe, and Asia. Then after several tens of thousands of years, they would would retreat over just a few thousand years to a period of warmer global climate. The Pleistocene also saw significant evolutionary developments and migrations for humans. For instance, Homo erectus emerged in the early Pleistocene and the atomically analogous modern Homo sapien appeared later in the epoch, eventually colonizing most of the planet. The Pleistocene also witnessed the megafaunal extinctions where many large animals like woolly mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats eventually went extinct. This was partly due to human hunting pressures, but it was thought mostly to be driven by the significant climate shifts that could have disrupted habitats and food sources in many of the megafaunal species as the planet transitioned into its second epoch, the Holocene. We've had one, yes. What about second epoch? From about 12,000 years ago to the present day marks the most recent period where the glaciers retreated and the planet has seen relatively stable and warm climate conditions. Here's where the terminology gets, I think, a little bit confusing. We are still technically in an ice age, just an ice age where the glaciers don't cover as much of the planet as they can do. We call this period an interglacial period. 50 million years ago, the planet was too hot for any ice to form at the poles, so relative to that, the Earth is definitely still in an ice age. This most recent Holocene epoch is significant for human history as the stable and comparatively warm climate allowed for the development of agriculture and consequently the growth of large human settlements and complex societies, culminating obviously in the creation of social media. The transition that brought us from the Holocene and from all glacial to interglacial periods are called Ice Age termination events. Again, we're still in the Ice Age, yes it's confusing. These termination events are typically made up of three distinct phases, though exactly the demarcations between each phase kind of vary depending on which researcher you're actually talking to. The first phase is called the deglacial onset. It's slow but steady increase in global temperatures, marking the beginning of the end for the glacial period. It usually lasts several tens of thousands of years. This is often driven by changes to Earth's orbit called Milankovitch cycles. These predominantly relate to how the Earth is angled or orbiting around the Sun. Starting with eccentricity, it describes the Earth's orbit around the Sun and measures how much the orbital path deviates from a perfect circle. This can vary from zero, it's a perfect circle, to around 0.067, it's more of an oval or an ellipse. Currently, the eccentricity is around 0.017, so we are pretty circular in our orbital nature. 
When the Earth's orbit is more elliptical though, the difference in solar energy that the Earth receives, called insulation, which is a word I have to look up every single time I need it, between the closest approach and the most distant approach can vary tremendously. This effect has a periodicity of roughly 100,000 years, and over the past 800,000 years, for which we've got data from ice records, termination events have been pretty well aligned with this cycle, leading to major glacial to interglacial shifts, approximately 100,000 years apart. But actually, Actually, we don't think that this particular factor is the predominant Milankovic driver of a termination event. As the Earth rotates around the Sun, it is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees, but over time this oscillates between approximately 22.1 and about 24.5 in a period of 41,000 years from minimum to maximum, or about 82,000 years for a full oscillation from 21 degrees all the way up and then all the way back down again. When the tilt is greater, what this does is expose a larger polar region and means that it receives more solar radiation during the summer, which can ultimately lead to more rapid melting of the ice sheets. This, in turn, can have various feedback effects on the global climate. Looking at these events over the last 800,000 years, you can see there's a huge amount of correlation between when they occur and when we are triggered into an ice age termination event. Today, the axial tilt is decreasing from its maximum value and is moving towards the lower end of the range, which should in theory be reducing the amount of melting effects on the ice caps. The final effect that I wanna talk about is precession, the wobble of the Earth's axis and affects the timing of the seasons relative to the position of Earth's orbit around the sun. This precession cycle operates on timescales of approximately 19,000 to 23,000 years, and we again see pretty regular alignment between these occurrences and termination events. It obviously isn't perfect though, it seems to be a combination of all these factors working together that actually drive a termination event to start. These three Milankovitch factors drive a feedback loop which further propagates warming of the planet. As the ice begins to melt, darker ocean or land surfaces are exposed. These darker surfaces are better absorbers of sunlight, which leads to further warming and more melting. As the process continues, the Earth enters a rapid warming period called full deglaciation with significant further ice melt and a corresponding rise in sea levels over a very short period, usually over a matter of just decades. This process is driven by the rapid release of greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane, which were previously dissolved in cold oceans or in the now melting permafrost ice layers. The release of these gases drives further warming, accelerating the process and often driving reorganization and strengthening ocean currents, which serve to distribute heat more evenly around the planet. It's only after this second rapid heating phase that global temperatures begin to stabilize, marking the onset of an interglacial period, which is the period that we are in now. These ice sheets will also stabilize and start to reduce their size, and sea levels will broadly come into some level of equilibrium. While the system is still influenced by continuing effects of increased greenhouse gases and Milankovitch cycles, negative feedback loops begin to play a more substantial role. For instance, as temperatures increase, the growth of vegetation in previously ice-covered areas acts as a carbon sink absorbing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Over a longer timescale, weathering processes on land can then start to draw down atmospheric CO2 and lock it away in sediments and deposits, while it also equilibrates with the now warmer ocean oceans, all of which serve to stabilize CO2 and temperature levels in the atmosphere. This is the phase we're in now, the Holocene, the interglacial period, so why, as of 2006, have we started to see this huge methane increase that we would only typically usually see in deglaciation phases of an ice age termination event? It has been just 12,000 years since the last one, not the usual 100,000 years that we usually see between the two what is going on. But first, I have to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the reason why I am where I am today. That sounds overly dramatic, but it is absolutely true. I launched my first company to help scientists start startups based on their scientific breakthroughs. Having an incredibly intuitive, easy to use website builder to build a strong brand to communicate a mission was a central piece of what made our teams differentiated and look like companies that were professional and ready for investment. I built about 40 Squarespace websites in the past four years because having tried pretty much all of the other 
other options out there, it is an order of magnitude friendlier, easy to use, and more powerful. Squarespace lets you get started by using one of their professional website templates, and then it adds a huge amount of customizability on top of that. What they've done recently with their Fluid Design Engine has taken an already great product to the next level, making it super intuitive to design a website that you want, while the platform helps you build a strong and consistent aesthetic throughout. We're in a digital world, and I think everyone needs some level of internet presence. Building a personal or a team website is a fantastic place to start. Head to squarespace.com forward slash Dr. Ben Miles to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain using the code Dr. Ben Miles. Thank you, Squarespace, for existing. Now, back to the video. Although human emissions soared in the 1980s as the natural gas industry boomed, by the 1990s these levels had stabilised. The 2006 findings prompted a wave of investigation to find the source of why methane had suddenly started to increase again. This, it turns out, is a reasonably difficult thing to do. Methane is a hydrocarbon and it's one of the principal components of natural gas. Methane is produced naturally in wetlands, oceans, geological processes such as venting, and obviously through other biological processes where usually cow farts get the majority of the blame. Methane typically remains in the atmosphere for about a decade at a time before it is broken down predominantly by hydroxy radicals to form CO2 and water. While there is a much shorter lifetime for methane by comparison to something like CO2, it has a much higher warming potential for a couple of reasons. Methane's bonds and its structure are very effective at absorbing and emitting infrared radiation, heat, specifically at about 3.5 and 8 microns wavelength. That 3.5 and 8 micron band is also in an atmospheric window that usually can make its way freely out to space, whereas CO2 absorbs around the 4 micron and 15 micron wave band, which the atmosphere already absorbs effectively. This makes methane's contribution to the greenhouse effect much more pronounced. In the past few years, we've become significantly better at detecting where methane is actually coming from, both from the ground and from space, as in measuring it from satellites, not leaks from space. There are a few ways of doing this, passively and active approaches. But one that I want to talk about that I think is particularly interesting is by firing a laser at the ground. If you pick a wavelength of laser that's either 3.5 or 8 micron, in the infrared, the Earth looks a bit like a mirror and actually a lot of this light bounces off of the ground and some small fraction of it will make its way back up into the sky to your satellite. By sweeping the laser over the ground, if you suddenly see much less laser light coming back to you, you know that it must have been absorbed. And most likely it was absorbed by methane, because nothing else in that band really absorbs those wavelengths. This can help you create a map of methane levels around the planet. In one search for methane that I saw, teams from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory detected a plume of methane at least three miles long in the sky above an Iranian landfill. This newfound super emitter is pumping out about 18,700 pounds or 8,500 kilograms of methane into the air every single hour. That's a lot, but interestingly, it pales in comparison to a cluster of 12 super emitters spotted in Turkmenistan, all of them associated with oil and gas infrastructure, and some of those plumes are up to 20 miles long, and together they're adding about 111,000 pounds or 50,000 kilograms of methane to Earth's atmosphere every hour but these are reasonably recent events. The most recent findings published in Global Biogeochemical Cycles, which is a mouthful, points to methane emissions increased from tropical and wetland regions, as increased temperatures and CO2 levels have driven faster growth. This has meant that when trees and plants grow and then die and start to decompose, it drives a higher rate of methane release. We've touched on this already, but also permafrost regions store vast amounts of carbon, estimated to be about twice as much carbon as there currently exists in the atmosphere, but they also contain trapped organic material. As the permafrost thaws, the organic material within it begins to decompose, also releasing methane and further CO2. Similarly, while many modern landfills have methane capture systems, not all of that methane is captured, and some is released into the atmosphere. The methane sensing technology I described previously is actually being deployed to both oil and gas infrastructure as well as landfills to help better map leaks and collect methane emerging from the ground. 
And I would like to say that this is because we care about the environment and the climate, but actually I think the stronger motivator is that if you can stop leaks, you save money, or if you can capture methane emerging from the ground, you can pump it into a gas electric plant and burn it to produce electricity, then sell that electricity to the grid to make money turning a literal pile of hot garbage into cash. And yes, this also generates CO2 burning methane, but that's the lesser of two greenhouse gases to emit. So what does all this actually mean for us? Although agriculture and waste sources have increased between 2006 and 2022 to account for about half of the methane increase that we see, the other half of recent growth in methane emissions is believed to be driven by natural biogenic processes, especially the wetland feedback loop. And although the increase in global biogenic methane emissions is within the multi-century range of historic emissions, meaning that it's not totally unusual that the planet could be producing this level of methane, the speed and acceleration of this most recent trend is extreme by all historical standards, even during the post-1800s rise driven by fossil fuel use. This component of methane's current change is likely outside anything nature has ever done before, at least in recent history. All that to say, it's not that we can't account for the methane increase, we're getting increasingly sophisticated at understanding where it is exactly being emitted from, it's more that we don't know what line this trend will follow. And if it isn't directly us producing methane, but nature itself, it's potentially much harder to slow down or interfere or to stop this process. Capturing methane is really difficult, even compared to capturing CO2 out of the air. This is partly because methane is about 200 times less abundant in the atmosphere than CO2. There are some approaches out there that I've seen, things like zeolites, which are porous minerals that can convert methane to CO2. This approach and other ones like it, though, have largely gone underexplored because producing CO2 isn't a very useful byproduct at the moment. But if it means that less potent greenhouse gases are emerging into the atmosphere, some development in this area might actually be worthwhile. The question remains though, what is driving the change in our biomes that has moved them to this mass methane output? And will it slow down or will it get worse? Question two is what does this actually mean for our planet? And there the honest answer is we don't really know. The only thing we have to compare it to is past ice age termination events as a somewhat proxy of what might be happening here. But this isn't a termination event driven by the usual mechanisms. So we are totally off book in terms of what that actually means and what could be expected to happen here. If we are in a termination-like event, given that we're in an interglacial period at the moment where the glaciers are already receded, could this knock us out of an ice age entirely? At the moment, like I said, we really don't know. In the words of the researchers in the most recent study, it remains possible that methane's current growth is within the range of Holocene variability. But it is also possible that this shift may indicate a large-scale reorganization of the natural climate and biosphere is already well underway. Has merely a single pandemic or only a handful of financial crashes left you wanting more termination-like events in your life? I just did a video on NASA's work to deflect city-destroying asteroids. You can check it out here. If you like this sort of content, please do consider subscribing. Or if you like this video, please do leave a like to support the channel. If you think scientists are rock stars, go grab a t-shirt like this one. This one's Marie Curie looking kind of cool and witchy. The link will be in the description down below. Until next time, thanks for watching. Goodbye.